Yeah. Um, it was, <laughs> I guess I deserve it. Um, years ago, a few years ago, we had one of the top gospel singers in the whole country. Yeah, and, um, and, and we had a concert here, and um, I, was, I was looking after him, and we said, okay, it's time to go. So he said, any last words? I mean, he's, at that stage, he was like, they were playing his song every hour on the radio, um, Christian radio. So I said to him, don't be boring. And he, the sh look of shock on his face, but, uh, you know, so I guess I deserve it. Anyway, um, so tonight, please be here at seven o'clock. We're going to, the glory of the Lord has been coming in our worship services, and, I, and it's going to be online, but let me tell you, like, um, who was here on Wednesday night of Faith Fellowship? Um, Gavin, glad you were there. Anyone else? The glory of the Lord. Oh, Yolandi. Um, Yolandi and Ashwell, yes, you were there. Um, the glory of the Lord filled the room. And I, want, I don't want you to miss out on that tonight. Okay. Now, I'm a, I come from a legal background, and we like to think of, of ourselves as terribly rational. <clears throat> to be honest, at times, we're not. We, they, they fight at times. Get, people get very upset in court because it's a very, very high-pressure environment. But ultimately, if you talk to most lawyers you will find that they think of themselves as rational. And also they, um, they, 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 I was talking to a guy whose job is to manage attorneys um, yesterday, and he was saying they're actually very difficult to manage. They all know, think they know better. But those are attorneys, not advocates, so... Um, Anyway, just saying. But, uh, but, but the bottom line is, is that I come from a very rational background. But I have no difficulty um, believing in the supernatural. And the reason why is, is because when I was very young, I, um, my mom and dad's church, um, you see there, Used to be, it was first called ERC, Evangelical Revival Center, and then we start, shortened it to Revival Center. Um, the ERC just stuck. So, um, and and so, and I've told you about the famous time when my my dad prayed for a stone blind man, and that got him out of an arrest the next day. Um, for those of you who are worrying, wondering, it was a trumped-up charge that they had tried to do to persecute him. But it even got into all the newspapers. So I'm going to test how old you are. So it got into the Evening Post. <laughs> Half of the congregation are like, what? The Evening Post? I'll... I'll I'll, I'll show you how old you are now. It even got into the Oosterlich. For those of you who don't know what the Oosterlich was, that was the predecessor to Die Burger, which I think has also basically disappeared. So, um, and the weekend post used to come out on a Saturday evening because the the Saturday morning there was still a herald. Yes. So the bottom line is it was a, it was a very long time ago. But they were incredible, and, and the miracles spread around. But there's one that I want to speak about specifically. What happened was, was that I was trying to remember how old I was. Um, if, if you... If you I would nearly say, if you put a gun to my head, please don't. But um, if anyone asked me, I would, I would probably say I was five years old. What happened was there was a young lady from Westring, and, she, and a family in our church brought her to church. 
And in the middle of the service, she manifested and ran out of the church. And um, the church was, um, and I'm going to put up the, the map. Is it up there? The church was in 3rd Avenue, Newton Park. And she, she ran out of the church. Um, I think they had tried to restrain her, and she broke from the restraints and st- to, to, because they were wanting to help her, and she was manifesting. And she, and she ran, and the, she, she broke from the restraints of, I think, three men. And then she ran, and they got into the car. They actually got into two cars, and they chased her and, um, to get her back because, I mean, she was a young 17-year-old, small little girl running off into, into the night screaming. And she, she, they chased her in a car, and they, she ran from the church. The church was opposite um, the spa. Yes, thank you, Sean. Um, and, and, it, and she ran right across. Okay, now we're going to really test how old you are. She ran right across the race course. A lot of you are like, what? A race course? Green Acres was a race course at that stage. They, they built Green Acres on top of a race course. Um, and, and now, if it, I, I apologize for making a portion of you feel this, this old, but yes. And she, she ran, and you see there, they caught her by the tennis courts next to collegiate, or in collegiate. And um, she, that, that's, uh, I measured it as the crow flies on Google, that's one and a half kilometers, basically a mile, although she would have run further than that. And it took, it took a car to catch her after one and a half kilometers. She must have broken the world record for because she because she jumped over the wall, the fence or whatever they had around the I I, I don't remember um, she jumped and and just ran right across and they chased her and and um, as I say they caught her just outside opposite on the road by collegiate and it took eight men to restrain her big men and she was a little girl. 17 year old girl she wasn't she wasn't a, a, um, she wasn't muscular anyway she was a slip of a woman and they brought her back to the church and they cast demons out and I was five years old I was, my mom took me home that should make all of you feel old but um, and she was totally delivered but to see something like that at a young age made a huge impression on me because I knew like I knew like I knew that demons are real because I'd seen it because there was no there was no next natural explanation for why a young girl of 17 years old a slip of a girl could throw that it took eight men to hold her down and and um and then for her to be able to run like that. I mean, to be, to be honest, I, I think it would have taken a, I don't think that a male Olympic champion could have run at that speed. It was supernatural. And so what happened is, how did she manage to get these demons inside of her? Well, what happened was she was in, I think it was standard nine, grade 11 or standard eight. She was standard nine when this happened, but I think when she was in grade nine, maybe standard seven, maybe standard eight, someone threw a maths compass across the class and it lodged in her eye. And I'm sure he was throwing it at his friend, not at her. I'm sure he wasn't trying to throw it into her eye, but she lost her eye and she ended up with a glass eye. And she was a very attractive woman, young lady, and suddenly she had to walk around at school with a glass eye. And you can understand why, why the trauma of that must have been immense, you know, to go from being a, 
sort of popular, attractive young lady to the, the one with a glass eye. Must have been quite a, a blow to her. And so she, <clears throat> what happened is she became, she became very embittered and very angry with the guy who did this and about what, she, what had happened to her. Um, who, here, who here can see that? You know, it's, it's quite remarkable. And I can understand why she fell into that trap, but, but here's the thing, is that the devil is an absolute opportunist. A, the devil is cruel, he has no mercy. And even when you can see how people can become embittered and angry and unforgiving, he takes advantage of that situation. And here's the thing is that he's taken advantage of that situation in some of your lives. And so how does this actually work? Well, Ephesians 4 verse 26 says, and don't sin, sin by letting anger control you. So if you get angry about something, don't let it control you. But then I'm going to read you, I think, the scariest scripture in the whole Bible. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If that doesn't send a, a shiver cold shiver down your spine, then you don't understand what I've just read. And here's the thing, is that, is that what happened with that young lady is that she became ang angry. Can we see why she became angry? Of course she can, you can. Can you see why she became bitter about her situation? Of course you can. Here's the problem is that the she gave a foothold to the devil through that anger and bitterness and the devil exploited it and filled her with demons to the point where she could run by supernatural force and throw three, four men around like they were toys. But that, if you think that sounds cool, it was also eating her alive and destroying her. And so if she hadn't, if she hadn't manifested and, we, and, that, and the demons hadn't been thrown out of her, it would ultimately have destroyed her. And so <clears throat> a lot of people say, yeah, but I'm a Christian. I can't, I, I can't um, be demonized. Well, let's, let's think quickly about who was this written to? Now, if there was ever a success in Paul's ministry, it was in, in Ephesus. In fact, it's in the two years that he spent there, he, in the two years that he spent there, he, two million people, because they believe that was the population of Asia, heard the gospel. In fact, it was such a strong church, they believe it was about 15,000 members it was such a strong church that when Paul left later, do you know who became the, the, the senior pastor of the church in Ephesus? John the Beloved. And he pastored that church with Mary, the mother of Jesus. He was looking after her there until he became too old to pastor any longer. So this was, an inc and if you read in it, if you read in Revelation, um, the seven churches, the, the church in Ephesians, the Ephesus, in Ephesus is mentioned there, and, and they, were the best, they were the best of the bunch. None of them come off particularly well, but the, the church in, in Ephesus was by far the best. So, um, so these were not ungodly, unsaved people. These were children of the Lord, that had given place to the devil. And he was warning them, don't give a foothold to the devil. Why? Because he will take it. Because he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And if, if you give him a foothold, he will use it to destroy you. So this isn't some idle warning to, you know, 
terrible people. This is, this is people in a good church. So let's have a look, uh, look at it a bit more. So how does this happen? Um, and it says um, in John 14, verse 30, I will not speak with you much longer. This is Jesus speaking. For the ruler of the world, Satan is coming and he has no claim on me, no power over me, nor anything that he can use against me. So what happens were, it happened was that as Jesus went to the cross, Satan tried to attack him. But there was nothing, there was no place for a foothold. And so Satan could get no traction in Jesus' life. Because if Satan is such, if, if Satan could have got traction in Jesus' life, he would have won. But he could not. Why? Because he had nothing in common. He had no claim. There was no overlap between Satan and Jesus. And so that's, that's the result we're looking for, is we're looking for people, and I, would, I want you guys to be like that, where the, you have nothing in common with Satan. So... Um, And, and this is what God wants to do. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Now, you guys, I don't know if you know this, but you are made of body, soul, and spirit. So what is your body? Well, that's the easy one. It's your outer shell. I heard someone call it a husk. Let's, let's be body positive here. Outer shell. That's, that's the, your tent, the Bible calls it. Then, then there is your soul, and that's your inner being, the essence of who you are. I discovered that ancient Hebrew, Hebrew didn't have a word for brain. It, and so... So when they speak of heart, it's the very essence, the core of who you are. And it, it's made up of your thinking and your personality and who you are. That is your soul. And then the third is your spirit. And that's like today when you were, when you were communing with the Lord as you, in praise and worship, that was your spirit making contact with God, who is a spirit. And so we made it of spirit, soul, and body. If you come and you give your life to Jesus and you put him in charge of, you, of your life, what do you do? What happens is your spirit is instantly made alive and is perfect. Then your soul is being saved. So there's a process of your soul being saved, being redeemed, being sorted out. And then your body will be saved when the resurrection comes because you'll be given a supernatural, a heaven, I'm trying to think what the word is, a incorruptible body, one that won't die. So what's happening is, is your spirit is, is perfect, your soul is being saved and your body will only be saved when Jesus returns. Sorry. <laughs> For those of you who are keen. And that's why eventually age takes an effect on your body. Why? Because it's the power of sin on our bodies. And so what happens is, is, the, is, is that we get injuries or wounds in our soul which make us angry because angry anger is a defensive emotion. So you are never just angry. The voice is already crying out. Um, you are... You, where was I? Oh, yeah. So you, 
So, so if you're angry, it's because you're either fearful or you betrayed. Anger is the defensive mechanism or maybe the attacking mechanism that you have. But ultimately, it's, it's something that, you're, that, you, that you build to protect yourself from the more injury. Unfortunately, too often, it ends up in making things worse. But the bottom line is, is that anger gives place to the devil. And it's because of wounds in our soul. So in Isaiah um, 30 verse 26, it says, it says, in the day... It, in the day the Lord binds up the fracture of his people and heals the wound he has inflicted because of their sins. So what we see is if we sin, so, so the Bible, basically what sin is, is it brings about wounds or imperfections in our soul which give place to the devil. That's why God doesn't want us to sin because it gives us foot, gives footholds to the devil places to control, handles on you. And so, so, what, and, and so this young lady became angry and bitter and the sun set on her anger and, her, and bitterness and what happens? She's given place to the devil and more and more demons arrived because you need to have pretty, a lot of demons to, to be able to do what she had done. So, I want to show you, give you an illustration of what I'm speaking about. So let's look in Luke 8, verse 22 to 27. And it says, so they arrived in the region of the Gerizines, across the lake from Galilee. As Jesus was climbing out of the boat, a man who was possessed by demons came out to meet him. For a long time, he had been homeless and naked, living in the tombs outside the house. Now, I want to pick up on a few things. First of all, he was possessed by demons, and what was the result? He was homeless and naked. Now, in Israel, it's flippin' hot in the summer, if you excuse my language, and freezing cold in the winter. So to be homeless and naked is not what you want to have in Israel. You, you, you was bright red, probably, from the sun depending on how much melatonin he had in his skin. I don't, the Bible doesn't tell us. But the bottom line is, is that he was suffering and the demons were tormenting him. Why? Because they can. What is their job? It's to kill, steal, and destroy. They were, they were destroying this young man, this man's life. We don't know how old he is actually. And he'd been homeless and naked, living in tombs outside the town. Now, why would the demons go and take him among the tombs? Why the tombs? Well, well what, do, what is a tomb? It's a memorial to a bereavement, a hurt. So what happens is, is we collect these wounds to our soul. And we build these memorials to them instead of letting them go. And that brings place for the devil. And so literally, this, young, this man was bound by the devil. He was held captive by the devil. And he was held captive because he didn't let go of his remembrances, his memorials, his tombstones, the stuff that had hurt him. Which is why it's so important that we let things go. Does, do bad things happen in the world? Of course they do, sadly. If you've been watching the news, especially if you like France, stop now. <laughs> you know, but in general, the news has been just... I haven't seen a, a snippet of good news in years now. <laughs> you know, maybe the best news was when lockdown was over, but that was just 
it just got a little bit wor- better after, you know, the worst got le- less worse rather than good things happening. And so, and so, um, and so this, this man was bound because of his memories, his hurts, his disappointments. And it says, day and night he wandered among the burial caves in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. Now, in the last few years, I've heard about more and more people, especially young, la- young girls, cutting themselves. And that's a sign of oppression by the devil. It's the same demon that this guy had who's attacking these, these people. That's why, they, that's why they cut themselves. Otherwise, it makes no sense. And it's because, it's because this demon is oppressing them. Unfortunately, they have given place to the devil because something bad has been done to them. So, so what, what, when Jesus gets out of the boat, the demon screamed out, what business do we have in common with each other, son of God? Have you come to torment us before the appointed time of judgment? So they, A, they know that, they're gonna be a, that there will be a appointed time of judgment where they will be tormented. But they, because they were tormentors, that's the only way they can think about anything. And so they could not torment Jesus because they couldn't find anything in common. They couldn't find a foothold for the devil in Jesus. There was no place that they could grab hold of to torment him. And so they understood that he had great, greater power than them. And so they were what? They were fearful of what he was going to do to them. Why? Because there was no place. They, they could find no foothold. And so therefore they understood that he had greater power than them. So, um, Jesus demanded, what is your name? Legion, that he, he replied. Now, a legion in the Roman army, and, and you must remember, we must always interpret the Bible in the context of the, of, of the time that it was written in, because that's how people, so when when the demon said legion, and we don't know if the devil was telling the truth, whether there really was 6,000 demons, but that was how much a legion was. And so this man was full of 6,000 demons. That's why he was running around, cutting himself in the, in, in the graveyard. And he was filled with many demons. The demons kept begging Jesus, not to send them into the bottomless pit. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby, and the demons begged him to let them enter into the pigs. So Jesus gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned. This is where swine flu comes from, because swine (laughs) flu. See, Manny, that's a pun. People laugh. (laughs) Swine flu. Thank you. I have never seen a pun be given a hand clap before in my life. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Aren't you impressed that I even got a hand clap, Maddie? Have you ever had? (laughs) Anyway. I actually came up with this, that on the spot in the eight o'clock service. I thought I'd try it on you guys. And you guys also liked it. So, wow. 
This is a great day. <laughs> so, of course, so why did they want to go into the pigs? Is because demons crave a body. They crave a body. Of course, they didn't understand that the pigs were smarter than the man. Because they didn't want any, they, they weren't willing to give any place to the devil. Now, now it's in, it, we carry on in Luke. Then those who had seen what happened told the others how the demon possessed. So what happens is, let me maybe before I read this to you, what happens is, is the guy gets completely set free. He's been naked, he's now dressed, he's sitting there calmly. In fact, he actually, Matthew t- tells us that Jesus sends him off to become, to become an evangelist in the Decapolis. That was an area of 10 towns on the other side, the Transjordan, the other side of Jordan. And so um, all the people in the region, the Gazarenes, uh, so let me read it to you. So the, Then those who had seen what happened told the others how the demon-possessed man had been healed. All the people in the region of the Gazarenes begged Jesus to go away and leave them alone for a great wave of fear swept over them. Now, let's think about this. Um, There was a real respect and even awe of the dead at that time. Wouldn't you... And people would obviously want to go into the graveyard to remember their dead or put flowers or whatever they did at that stage. Wouldn't you want, who, who do, you, do you think that many people went into the graveyard when there was a man howling and cutting himself? So, like I want to go to the graveyard, let's get a posse of 30 people together just in case he comes out. So he wasn't a benefit to that community at all. Yet when, he get, when a big problem for that community gets solved, what do they do? They throw the guy who solved the problem out. Why? And this is why Jesus allowed, this is why Jesus allowed the demons to go into the pigs. Why? Because the people of that area wanted the demons. And how do we know that these people didn't want to serve God? Who here knows that there's one food that a Jewish person cannot eat? Pork. What are they doing with a herd of 3,000 pigs? These people were total lawbreakers. They... They, they had established escort before escort was even invented. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, you know the, on the bacon, escort? It's the town escort in KZN. They've got these huge herds of pigs. And I think they would have been pleased with a herd of that size. 3,000 pigs is a massive herd. It's remarkable. I've never heard of a a herd that big. So these guys were serious lawbreakers and they wanted the demons there. That's why Jesus allowed them to stay because if you want a demon, you can keep him. Yeah. If you want to keep your demon, don't let me stop you. If you want the results of the, uh, you need to understand that then you're accepting the results of keeping the demon. But these people wanted to, because they wanted to continue to rebel against God. They wanted to continue to be lawbreakers. They didn't want to change. They'd rather have a guy howling and, and cutting himself in their graveyard than change. And so Jesus said, well, fine. And Jesus left. And this is one of the big mistakes we make when we read the Bible, is we don't imagine it. So imagine the disciples and Jesus going back a 
across the lake. What was floating in the lake? 3,000 pigs were floating in the lake. Imagine rowing through the pigs. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Imagine having to row through a, a, a herd of 3,000 pigs. You must imagine the Bible when you read it. Anyway, so they chase Jesus away because they want to keep their demons. I want to give you another example of this. In Luke um, 13, verse 10 to 13, and it says, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues, he being Jesus, on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had, been, who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. So what did she have? She had a disabling spirit. The, a lot of you guys remember the King James or know the King James, spirit of infirmity. And, and she was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. Now, can I tell you that I think this is one of the most surprising things in the Bible? Why? Because I would have thought that someone who is bent over is because of a physical thing. But this was supernatural. Can you imagine the cruelty of a demon to, to bend a woman over that she, that she has to be, that she's bent in double, all crooked and out of shape? Can you imagine the cruelty of doing that for 18 years? Can you imagine how much that demon hated and wanted to destroy that woman? It's disgusting. So why could, why could that happen? It says she had the disabling and the spirit of infirmity or the disabling spirit is one that does what? It produces, it, it, it speaks of a weakness in the body or soul. And so what we see is, is that she had a weakness in her soul which allowed the demon to destroy her body. And she was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, she called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And, she laid, and he laid his hands on her, and immediately she made straight, and she glorified God. I believe the reason why Jesus first spoke, said, You are free, and then laid his hands. And we see that pattern often when Jesus heals someone who, who's afflicted by a demon, is he casted the demon out first and then he healed her physically by laying hands on her. And so she became straight. Why? Because the demon that had been, that it had been buckling her body was removed. That's how cruel a demon is. That's why it's so important that you give no place to the devil. So, what does God want for us? One, um, 2 John 1 verse 2, very famous scripture. Behold, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. So God wants to bless your soul. He doesn't want you to be full of wounds. Why? Because he doesn't want to give you place for the devil because God loves you and wants the best for you. Okay, I'm gonna do a Superman jump. Um, you can mark my landing. The, the Bulgarian judge gave me an eight for that landing. And so, um, where, yeah, so God wants to do what? He wants to bless your soul. I'm going to ask the ushers to come up and start to hand out the wafers. I'm going to keep preaching while they do it. But if we can go ahead, and I want to thank Gret, um, not Bob and her team for all that they do for us. And the ushers as well.
So what do you do if you have a wound in your soul? It says, Ephesians 3 verse 30, I think, 20. 320, yeah. It says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we can ask or think. So when God comes into you, when you invite him into your life, what does he, try, what does he want to do? He wants to work inside of you. He wants, to, he wants to heal your soul. He wants to heal the wounds in your soul. And he wants to, to turn you into someone that's more awesome than you can possibly ask or think. Um, in fact, in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, it says, So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord and the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. He wants to turn you, make you to be like Jesus. Now remember, what did I teach you about Jesus? When the demons came to Jesus, they could find nothing in common. They couldn't find a foothold. And so, so Jesus wants to heal your soul to the point where there is no foothold for the devil. He wants to turn you into someone, someone beyond anything that you can imagine. He wants you, if you're ruled by anger or bitterness or disappointment, if, you've, if you're battling with depression, God wants to heal you to set you free. Bible says, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. A lot of people battle with hev depression, heaviness. How do you get rid of, how do you chase that demon? You put on the garment of praise. If you're battling with depression, I want, to, I want you to be here tonight. It's, it's how God is going to start to set you free. Incidentally, if you're not battling with depression, I'd want you to be here too. So, but the point is, is this is how God heals us. He sets us free. Why? Because he removes everything that holds us captive or, or that allows Satan to hold us captive. He heals our soul. And so when Satan comes to us, he, he will say, I have nothing in common with you. And so, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what it, how, how does this work? What is the mechanism? There are two mechanisms. There's the blood of Jesus that washes away our sin. And there is the power of God that heals us and changes us and be and and isn't it fortunate we do in communion we have as we celebrate communion we drink the juice which represents the blood of Jesus and we take the bread which re represents the power of God to heal you and restore you and set you free isn't that incredible that that we have the medicine for your soul right here You've got a wound for your soul. You've got a place where Satan is holding you captive. Lo and behold, we've got that here. Right here for you today. God is here to set you free, to heal you. The presence of the Lord is here to touch you. I want you to Experience the presence of God. Let him into that anger or bitterness that you've been battling with. Let him touch you. Let him set you free. So let's take the bread first. Don't wait for me. We're going we're gonna to pray. Say, Father, 
in the name of Jesus. I thank you that the body of Jesus was broken for me. That power released by it is for my healing, both my soul and my body. I ask you as we take this bread that you're going to heal me. Let's take it. <coughs> okay, now we go to the juice. Are you ready? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that through the blood of Jesus, Forgiveness is available to me. I repent of my sins, of my bitternesses, of my anger, and anything else that gives a place to the devil. And I receive that forgiveness now. I'm healed. Let's take it together. I'm going to ask Shane just to sing that song and I want you to close your eyes and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. This is important. Please don't walk around. It's Raise your hands, do whatever you need to do to receive the presence of the Lord. Ba 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 
There's a very strong presence of the Lord here to heal you. But I think that there's some people here who need a little bit of help because let's be honest, there's some terrible things that happen to us and we need to receive true healing. We need the Lord to touch us and there's some people who need a little bit of help here. You say, I think I've given a foothold to the devil and I want some help today. I want to get rid of the devil out of my life. I want you to raise your hand right up and out because I want to pray for you. Please raise your hand if the Lord is speaking to you. Say, I need to get rid of some stuff. I don't want to end up like that man in the, the graveyard. I want to leave my graveyard behind. I want to leave the monuments behind. I want... I want freedom, hallelujah. There's freedom available here, Lord. I'm going to ask everyone to stand up. And I'm going to ask Shane and Yolandi to keep singing. And if you raised your hand, you want more freedom, come and stand here in front of the communion table. If Bring your stuff if you've got stuff. Yeah, come stand across here. In the congregation, please just wait for us. We nearly we're not gonna be long, but I want you to be touched by the healing power of God here today. Enter in. The presence of the Lord is here to heal you. Hallelujah. We need altar workers. Lots of people who need help here. Jesus wants to set you free. The presence of the Lord is here. Jesus wants to set you free. Need lots of ladies. We need lady altar workers. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We need to s- need altar workers. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let your glory transform. In your the power of God. Jesus. You nearly had a breakthrough. Keep going. Oh, 
Urubu di Arababa, Narabasarababa, Narabe di Urubu, Urubu, Udi Ubu, Udushi di Urubu, Rababa, Narabana. I need a lot more ladies. Yes, Lord, Yarababa. In the audience, lift your hands. There's a presence of the Lord here to heal you, to set you free. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bedi arama baba naraba saraba naraba basha babono ye bebe ni ababa gadi araba baba naraba saraba naraba bana yo bodi araba bana the lord is here to heal you hallelujah hallelujah ye di araba bana araba bana araba saraba baba bana on the gallery god is wanting to touch you ye bebe ni arama mana araba bana there are people you've held anger against and Jesus is here to set you free. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Anger that you've held for so long. If we could get ashes here, if we could get ashes here, just to help this lady. Mariana, I think you need to pray with her. If you could, guys, can we get help to take her through? Take her through so long. Jesus is here to set you free. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to ask I'm going to ask the altar workers to take these ladies through. We've got a room at the back there. If you've got a bag or whatever still in the benches, bring it, get it. Um, please go through into the back with the altar worker. Thank you, Lord. The presence of the Lord is still here. He's still wanting to touch you. They've the people here that are saved, they're set free, but there's still, there are things that the Lord wants to help you to let go of today. He wants to remove the tombstones of your heart. He wants to set you free. I want to encourage you to get baptized. It's an important, it's so important if you want to be truly free. You have to be baptized. If you don't want to, if you want to give no place to the devil, the best thing you can do is get baptized. And so I want, and, and so we're baptizing on the 16th of July. If you've been wondering how to get involved in Word of Faith, we're having a pizza evening on the 10th of July. Come and join us. The Lord is doing something wonderful here and I want you to be part of it. And then of course tonight, it's going to be a real presence of the Lord as there was now. It's closing prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you that your presence is here and real and mighty, Father God. And thank you, Lord, that you're here to set us free. 
I pray, Father, that we will allow your Holy Spirit to come into every part of our lives and help us to let go of the tombstones on our hearts. And I pray, Father God, that you will bring lots of leaders in and make lots of people your leaders in your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that you're calling them. And Father God, we ask you in your precious name that you are going to give us a firehouse on every street, Lord. Help us to believe you and trust you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. Bless you guys. so much. Martin. I really love it. Honestly. The day I